I've gone down a scary spiral of audiobook listening. There is not a time of day where I do not have something playing in my ears now. It is fantastic, though. Like the amount of literature that I get to consume now is just, oh my God, I love it. Endurance by Alfred Lansing is the story of Ernest Shackleton and his crew of 27 men who sailed for the South Atlantic in 1914, intending to cross the Antarctic over land. In October 1915, still a half continent away from their intended base, the ship was trapped and then crushed in ice. Shackleton and his men were castaways in one of the world's most savage regions. Welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today, one of my favorite Canadians has returned to the show. Erin Walker was previously on the Cookbook Palooza episode, and I've convinced her to come back to talk more books. Erin is an avid and adventurous reader and learner, and we had the best time talking about how a good adventure book can read like great fiction, and whether or not we would survive that kind of trial. Spoiler alert, she would, I wouldn't but you all already know that. This one is yet another in the million examples of books that I wouldn't have picked up on my own. And I'm so glad now that I did, because I'm pretty sure I agree with Erin that Endurance is the best book ever. Hi, Erin. Welcome back to the Best Book Ever podcast. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me back, Julie. (laughs) I've had you on once before. You're one of the co-hosts of the Three Kitchens podcast in which you cook things with your besties. And I had all three of you on the show before to discuss cookbooks, but now I get to talk other books with you. And by the way, as I said on that show, I think reading cookbooks counts as reading. But today we're going to talk other types of reading. So tell me a little bit about your own non-cookbook reading life? I've always liked to read. My parents were always readers and I was always a reader. I read anything and everything. I kind of got out of reading through university and I never discovered my public library until, oh, I, I would say like 10 years ago, I discovered that my public library, you can take out books and like reserve them, they, the app like lets you make a little to be read list. And yes. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> because I hated, there were so many times I go through the bookstore and I didn't really know what I wanted to read. And I was choosing books by their cover and that was sometimes good and sometimes bad. And it was always like a big cost to like, oh, I'm going to spend 50 bucks on a book. What am I going to read? So now that I have the library app, I've discovered that I can read anything all the time, whenever I want. So I started reading books from the library. And that's when I was like, I want to catch up on all these books I've never read before, that I've always heard of. So I got to read books like The Alchemist, because I had heard people talk about it, and I had never read it. And I read A Tale of Two Cities, and that was really, really hard. And, but I really enjoyed it too, because there were books that I never read. And so I don't consider myself a great in terms of literature, just because I didn't do great in English in high school. I was denied admission to the program I wanted to do in university because my high school English marks weren't good enough. But I find now that I read more, now I'm getting into it more and I love being part of a book club that I joined in 2018, and we read really interesting books that really challenge a lot of our thoughts and ideas about everything. We, We read really, really challenging books that kind of push you out of your comfort zone, that make you sort of think and see things differently. Is that the goal of your book club is to read challenging things? Or is it just a group of people who choose really diverse literature that the rest of y'all aren't listening to or that you aren't reading? We definitely came together, I think, to challenge each other. And we also support each other really well. And we're comfortable with having really uncomfortable conversations. And that was the one thing that I loved about 
the book club that I'm in and that I hear complaints about other people's book club is that sometimes it gets too vanilla and it's like nothing that really pushes boundaries or makes you think. And so this one, there will often be, you know, heated discussions and we have these fantastic conversations and and really you know challenge each other to to think differently or to back up our opinions can you give me some examples of some of the books you've read for the book club so just recently we read detransition baby by tori peters and so that was a really good book to understand a story about somebody who's gone through transition Mm -hmm. and what that looks like and their experience in it. And so that was really interesting. We've read a lot of books about the Indigenous experience in Canada and what intergenerational trauma looks like. We read The Strangers by Katharina Vermet. It was a very hard and challenging story to read about intergenerational trauma from an Indigenous perspective. In your book club, how do y'all keep your relationship solid when you're dealing with some really, you're dealing with some hot button issues Mm -hmm. and people can veer widely on things? How do you have those conversations and then still want to show up the next month? I think we come into book club with an open mind and we know that just because someone's like challenging us that maybe they're not judging us Mm. and we'd work really hard at trying to communicate effectively with one another. And there have been times when things have been said and people have cried and there have been like apology texts the next day. Cause you know, we're also drinking at book club. (laughs) Yes. So it, it can get kind of, it can get really intense at the, at some points, mm. but many of us have a really strong relationship outside of book club, which is really nice. And we also support each other in other ways. A lot of us have really complex ADHD kids and a lot of us have gone through some really intense stuff in our time as parents. And so our kids have grown up together now and still continue to struggle but we also support each other and it's it's like that safe space where if you want to come in and be like I I don't like parenting today I don't want to parent or I'm having these problems and I don't know what to do there's also that really personal connection where we support each other on that it makes it easier because we've all been very open and vulnerable about our personal lives to then talk about these really intense topics I have found in my mothering life, if someone else in the room says, yes, I've been through that too, Mm -hmm. that's enough. Even if they say, there's no answer, this is just going to be shitty for the next two years. Yeah. Um, Knowing that you're not alone Mm -hmm. and and validating those feelings of like, I hate being a parent today Mm -hmm. or I suck at being a parent today. You know, being able to to express that and have other people be like, yeah, I've been there too. Like, you know, you're not failing. What do you read when you're on your own and it's not book club and you're mm-hmm. not prepping for your podcast, just on your own steam? What are you reading in your spare time? Like anything and everything. I will, really? I will really honestly read everything. Well, this is the problem with your podcast. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's like every time... I read a book title and I recognize it and it's something that I haven't read or I've been like, "Mm, I don't really like the Jane Austen one. It took me a while to like go and listen to that episode because I was like, there's no way I'm going to want to read that. (laughs) And then as I started listening more, I was like, oh, no, actually, I don't think I can listen to this because I'm going to want to read this (laughs) and I don't have time to read this. (laughs) What do you do when you hit a reading slump? I will rarely put a book back. Really? Even if you're disliking it, you're going to you're going to power through it? Yeah. Because I found even when I hate something, it's teaching me something. Mm. So, well, something I've noticed with our book club is if we read something where we all like it, it is usually the night where we don't really discuss the book much and mm-hmm. we just get into other chit-chat. 
Whereas books where we're like, ah, oh, I was uncomfortable by this, or I didn't like this part of the book, or I hated these characters. They were all just the worst people ever. And, but then we will talk all night about the book and get different viewpoints on things and really bring something from it. And then I'll sometimes go back and read those books again. Oh, wow. After book club. So I think it was in January, we, um, we read The Promise by Damon Galgut. And I think you've done that on your podcast, which is <laughs> what happens. But there were a few of us that had also heard of the title. And so it ended up, we voted this year based on a s- collection of people throwing in suggestions for books and then came up with our reading list. And so many of us didn't like the book or felt like we couldn't get into it or the characters were awful in it, but I'm now listening it again on audiobook so that I can rehear it and reread it again because the discussion we had was so good. So how is it different for you this time? Are you are you liking it more on the yeah, reread? Yeah. For sure. And I'm listening to it rather than reading it. And that has made a difference in a lot of the books that we've read, Mm -hmm. where if I've read the book and I haven't liked it, I've learned to go back and listen to it. Because sometimes it's better on audio. Last year, we read hell of a book. And I had a hard time getting into the way it was written. But when I listened to it, I enjoyed it 100 times more. That's and so, so I read that one twice as well. <laughs> Do you remember how you found this book that we're talking about today, Endurance by Alfred Lansing? So I read a book a few <clears throat> years ago by, I want to say Scott Kelly. Is he, It was one of the astronauts that went up to space. He had the same name title Okay. about the year he spent in space because he spent the longest consecutive days in space I think was it 2014 or 2015 it was fairly recently it was it was a really interesting story and he mentioned that this book Endurance by Alfred Lansing was his favorite book Mm. and I believe he read it multiple times when he was up in space because it's a long time trapped in a place not doing much which happens to be (laughs) (laughs) the experience of these people and so I went and downloaded this as an audiobook and the only thing I knew about this book was like Shackleton Boat Antarctica (laughs) I had no idea how the story went. I didn't know how it ended up. And I almost crashed my car a number of times listening to this. I was like like driving my kids to and from school and whatnot. And they're in the car and I'm like, oh my God, are you hearing this? (laughs) And so after I finished the audio book and was just like slapped in the face, blown away by this story, I was like, this is a book I have to own. Because that's another thing that I do is I don't own books until I've read them. So I buy books after I've read them or listened to them and said, this is something that needs to be on the shelf that my kids should read in the future, that I should read again, (laughs) all that kind of stuff. Why don't you tell our listeners what this endurance is about? Oh God, she's got notes. I bring out my notes. Listeners, she's got notes, extensive notes. notes. (laughs) If I tried to remember all of this because it's so intense. I would get off on a rabbit trail like halfway through my ex- <laughs> explanation of what this book is about. And then I'd be like, oh, let's talk about this. So fair, fair. Okay. So in the early 1900s, Ernest Shackleton wanted to cross the Antarctic continent on foot from west to east. So that's what he set off to do. And it didn't go as planned. And <laughs> he ends up getting stuck in the ice in his boat. They end up having to abandon ship because they get crushed. They have to live on the ice. My God, what is it? For 400 and some days trying to find their way back to civilization and survive. And I just can't get over the intensity and ability 
that they had to do this and the things that they survived through to do it in the way that they went about it while they were trying to do this. Because this is like pre-radio. They had no rescue plan. I listened to it on audio. And this sometimes the great benefit of not knowing history and also being a forgetful person is sometimes I listen to books and I'm like, I they might all die. I genuinely did not know what was going to happen. Yeah. So it, it really did read for me like a like a thriller almost. Yeah. Like, how is this going to end? Will they mm. make it? Who's who's going to be the first to go? Yeah. And and there are several points where someone has to go off and do something or this person went over this crest to see or or when they, they split, split up. up at the end. And every single time that happened, I was like, well, they're not coming back. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the last we're going to see of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> nice knowing you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just a really well-written book anyway, but not mm -hmm. knowing is makes it very dramatic. Yeah. That's what, that's what kept me so interested in it. As they came across these obstacles and things that happened, it was like, oh my God, they survived that. So tell me some of the things you have in your notes there. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh my God, it's stapled. <laughs> so first of all, I'm a cold weather climate person. I live in, we're, I'm in Alberta, Canada. It is, mm -hmm. we complain that it's winter nine months of the year. It's, but I like, I'm the only one out of my girlfriends that you know, and a lot of people that like the cold in the winter. Like mm -hmm. I am, I like going camping when it is snowing. I am, if it's minus 30 out, like I want to bundle up and go outside and just experience how awful it is. Like, <laughs> why? What's fun about it? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of thrilling and amazing that like we can go from this awful horribleness to like hanging out in shorts in the summer. I don't know. I love how extreme our weather can be. Mm -hmm. And, and I like to, I like to adventure. My guilty pleasure is going and pushing myself to do more and try more. And I love to hike. I love backpacking and I kind of like being uncomfortable and kind of appreciating what is really awesome about the fact that I get to like wake up in a bed and that I have a laundry machine and that I don't have to worry about a lot of things. Like it's, it's kind of fun to just go out and really appreciate what you do have when you come back and, uh -huh. and just the simple things that I love about being out. Like if I'm going to go out camping, my favorite thing is like boiling water and having a cup of tea at the end of the day and like, relaxing from all that you've done and like enjoying being outside. Okay. So as I was reading this, <sighs> I was thinking this about you because I know you are an adventurous type. And I was wondering if you were reading this with a different perspective than me, because I read it going, what is wrong with these men? <laughs> <laughs> Bunch of idiots. And I, every time I thought that I thought, I bet she thinks this is cool. So yeah. were you, do you read it as like, like it's inspirational for you? Oh, it's like the ultimate, it's like being the ultimate boy scout. Like the <laughs> fact, like they could, they took what they had and they were constantly like refashioning and remaking and creating stuff out of what seemed like nothing and having those skills to survive. I mean, I in no way would be wanting to eat seal and penguin and mm -hmm. my God, what way did they put it in? Whatever else was mixed in with the stew. Like, and they, they knew how to do these things. Even by the end, when they had to go and hike across a mountainous island, they were making their own like crampons using the nails from the boat and fastening to them their boots. And like, just that like ability to use what you have at your disposal or not really disposal, but what's available to you yeah. to then survive. It's cool. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> Do you think you could have done this? Oh God, no. Oh, I can't I imagine can. how awful. The thing that I think I definitely could not do is the wetness. Yeah. And I hate boats. <laughs> Oh, I yeah, hate, that would be a problem. Like, I hate the ocean. I hate being on boats, even when I can see land. I've sailed before multiple times. My parents were into sailing. 
as a kid, I, I really disliked it. I felt okay. very uncomfortable the entire time. Still so in the ocean. you could do the part where they're actually camping on the snow. It's just all the rest mm. of it you can do. I also don't really want to do that either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got I it. in no way want to do any of what they did. But it also makes me want to push myself further, at least at my level. I don't think I'm not going to fool myself or anybody in any way saying that, oh, yeah, I can go and, you know, ski across the Antarctic or some sort of crazy thing that people do these days. I love that somebody else wants to do that. And it makes me want to do what I do at my lower level. Yeah. If that makes sense. (laughs) <laughs> See, and I was wondering through the whole book, what is in them and what's in you to a, to a different degree that's not in me, <laughs> truly. Like, and, and I don't- You're going to come up here, Julie, and I'm going to take you into the mountain. <laughs> and I will go with you, but I just want you to know that when I am uncomfortable even the slightest little bit, I do nothing but complain. This morning, I put chili crisp on my scrambled eggs and I rub my Ooh. eyes and I swear to God, I am walking around like like I have been shot. <laughs> and it's just because <laughs> the side of my eye tingles a little bit and you would honestly think like I am suffering. And I've read a lot of these adventurous books. And Excellent. through all of these, my main thought is always, th- when I read these books, I always think, well, I would have died on chapter two. The thing that I thought was really important was the men's attitude as they went through this journey of terribleness. Like Mm -hmm. these are the worst of the worst conditions. Like when they talked about when they finally moved off the boat and had to camp on the ice in what I can only imagine are the most primitive of tents, nothing waterproof. Mm -hmm. And enjoyable to be in, shall we say, like the tent I like to camp in. (laughs) And it's wet. And their sleeping bags are wet. And the poor guy who has to sleep at the front of the tent, because they're crammed in there like sardines, has to continually get wet. And yet he's like, oh, it is quite... I I wrote this down because I was like, this is hilarious. But he was like, really, this sort of life has its attractions. That's just madness, right? That's like, like snow did that blindness make or something. you really question their sanity? Like, because you, like, you're you're coming at this from like, uh, I hate all of this. How can these people be so positive? And so, like, oh, the sun was out today and it was quite beautiful. But they're like sleeping in slimy sleeping bags. Oh like, my god, the slimy! When they said about the slime in the sleeping bags, I almost oh yeah, gag. That, that was, was a gag so moment. Disgusting. And there was nothing they could do about it. It's not like, oh, our sleeping bags are slimy. Let's throw them in the dryer. It was like, (laughs) our sleeping bags are slimy and this is now how we live. Yeah. Like it was just in accepting the way things were. Yeah. But I did, I really did like that whole section about the sort of peace that they found Mm. and, you know, how they would play their games at night and the conversations they'd have. And then the meals, like when they would describe meals to each other and there was a sort of peace to it. Yeah. Right. My family has a certain fondness for the quarantine mm. because my kids who live out of the house came back home and we were all six together and Aww. we just played games and, you know, watched movies together and we just, we were a very contained unit. And even though it was scary and we didn't know what was going to happen and all that kind of stuff, we were worried about everything, but there was a sweetness to it. There was a tenderness. I also think that I would, I would love if I could go back in time and meet anybody, I would want to meet this guy. Yeah. Like the fact that the way that he would think through things or at least how it was communicated in the book and how when they had to split up, it wasn't only about who was capable of coming, but who should not be left behind. Yes. And how he structured who lived with who and what people got on and what people didn't. And even how he constructed this group of people, which at the beginning they described as rather haphazard. Like his longest interview was like five minutes to figure out who's going to come on this 
harrowing journey. Not that he expected it to be this journey, but still the one he had in mind was not a picnic. Right. right? It was never going to be easy. No. And so I thought it was incredible how the team of people work together. Yeah. And the importance of that community. And it's almost like his skills are understanding personalities. Mm -hmm. Not so much because you would think like, well, you want the best navigator in the world. And it was almost like that wasn't his concern. The actual ability to work with others was his big concern. Yeah. Who's going to be strong? Who's going to fall apart? I don't want the fall apart guy on my team. And the stowaway. Oh, yes. What he, kind of jackass stows <laughs> away? I could not believe that. And he goes through quite, he, you know, he kind of gets it back. He, he, karma yeah. comes and bites him in the end because he ends up losing pieces of himself, shall we say? <laughs> sure, say it. But the wet. Yeah. The wet, wet, wet. They're always wet. The thing that I seriously almost crashed my car as I was driving when I first listened to this is this story when they are camping on the ice and the ice cracks directly under one of the tents and it is pitch dark, midnight black, and they all get out of this tent and they realize somebody's missing and there is this writhing sleeping bag in the water and they pull him out and because this ice is dynamic and moving the ice then slams back together just as they've taken this man and pulled him out yeah and i was like oh he's a goner (laughs) as i'm listening to this i was like oh my god i can't believe they got him out in time but he's he's done for he's gonna die no they make him walk around with two other people until he is dry enough to continue. And that is the worst <laughs> feeling too, right? A wet oh. sock is the grossest. And that was there 24-7. They yeah. slept in it. And even when, so the final attempt to get back home, and they launch this rowboat that's been modified into a sailboat. The Mind fact that they blowing. fit six people on it to begin yeah. with is like cozy. And they had to make their own (laughs) decking. And what do they do? Two of the six get dumped off into the water and have to swim back to shore. They exchange some clothing with other guys because they only have the clothes on their back. If I got dumped into like the water anywhere (laughs) around me any time of day in my clothing, day's over. (laughs) We're going home. Not just for me, for everyone. You all, just so you know, we are all going home because yeah. mom's uncomfortable. Fun time is over. <laughs> so tell me what else is in your notes. I thought it was kind of comical how upset they were every time they lost tobacco or when their tobacco ran out and they started smoking the lining of their boots and like the, the ridiculous things that bring you happiness in life. Like, you have to have a vice to get through life. You you can endure anything, but you also, you need, need that little bit of whatever that is getting you through. And, like, for them, I think it was the tobacco. And, like, even when the gentleman who fell into the water in his sleeping bag, the thing he was the most pissed off about, not being wet, not being cold, his tobacco had gone. (laughs) Like, and he was yes. cursing and complaining about it. Like, you need a vice. So it's okay. Whatever your vice is, like, you need that. And that, those are, I don't know. I just feel like there was so much in what happened, even though this is not something I will ever experience, or I think anyone will ever experience. There are so many good life lessons as how to get through things that are hard. When they were doing some of the most challenging things to imagine living through like when they were sailing from this little rock chunk of an island to another rock chunk of an island through what I can only imagine is and what has been documented as the worst seas or oceans on the earth the quote that I thought was so fantastic was life was reckoned in a period of a few hours or less you just 
you did only what was right in front of you. And I think Mm -hmm. any time that we are ever going through anything that's really challenging, being able to just shut down to only looking at what you have to do for the next day, hour, minute, to not overwhelm yourself with the overall task. And I feel like that's something that I'm always trying to impress on my kids is that like goals are great, but we need to have the steps on how to accomplish that, whether that's year long goals or week long goals or Mm -hmm. daily goals. Like, how are you going to go about that? And thinking about that is I think that's really, really cool how how much that made a difference in this book for getting through all of this stuff that is just horrendous. I mean, that's what I people keep trying to teach me in therapy and in yoga and in meditation is like, can you just calm down and think about this exact moment? And that's what I don't have that I think these guys have is this absolute focus on just do this thing that is in front of us and let's not panic about what might happen. And they have that in spades because they don't yeah. bitch and they just buckle down and handle it. So then I think that maybe answers my question as why I like doing somewhat crazy things mm-hmm. is because when you stop and you force yourself to do that, it makes you slow down enough that you can stop and actually see what is good. Yes, my mm-hmm. hands are freezing cold. Yes, it's, you know, minus 30 out. But look at the way that it feels when the snow sounds like styrofoam under my feet and how intensely cold that air is when I take a breath in and that it just, and my cheeks feel, you know, it's like stopping and feeling all of the stuff in the moment you're in and knowing that like in five minutes I can go back in the house and it's really not a big deal. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me, Erin, what is on your bookshelf right now? I've got More Than You'll Ever Know by Kate Gutierrez, I believe. And I just started that. It's a book club book. I believe it's like a true crime. It's a story about people who are into true crime and love true crime. Are you enjoying it so far? I take time to get into a book. Any book, I'm always like the first couple chapters, I'm like, oh, I don't know the names or the places or what's going on. I don't know. I I have to slowly get into yeah. it. Do you only read one book at a time or do you also have one going that's your non-book club book? I have a few things on the go at the mm-hmm. same time. On audio, I just finished a book called Lords of the Bow by Con Igledon. And it is the second book. I'm not sure how long the series is, but it's about Genghis Khan and his rise. And then the second book, the one I just finished, is about how he brought together the groups, the tribes of Mo- in Mongolia, and then went after modern day Beijing. But this was fantastic. Oh it was an incredible listen. I'm also reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Oh, really? Okay. It's, what do you think? I found it at a free little library as I do. And I'm like, oh, I've heard of this. I should be reading it. It is really dense to get through. It's my backpack book, as I like to call it. It sits in my purse. And <laughs> If I'm like waiting in line at the bank, out Mm -hmm. comes a book. If I'm, I've got to have some, some, something on me. And if it gets ruined, wrecked, crushed. Also, if I take six months to read it, which is kind of, I think where I'm at at this one now. Yeah. Then that's okay. And I can kind of keep up with it. It's nothing I love, but it's nothing I hate either. It's challenging. And I don't think I'm giving it as much brain space as I should. If that's the the backpack books, they almost have to be a little bit less exciting, don't they? Because you don't want to be, you know, at DMV or whatever and too absorbed in your book to look up when they call your name. You want it to be just enough to keep you occupied, but still aware of your surroundings. (laughs) And I can't read a lot of it at a time because it, it bogs down and 
makes you think a lot. Mm. It's like reading a textbook almost. You oh, kind of have to like digest some of the information they've told you about whatever and then think about it. <laughs> I've never read it, although it was big when I was in college. I'm going to wait till you finish it and then you could tell me if it's worth picking up. Mm. I say for sure, try it, but don't be committed to it. And that's why it's in my bag, because I'm seriously waiting in line at the bank. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, if I have to see this like thing go by on the TV screen again, telling me about how I'm happy and skipping through fields of flowers, I will yeah. stab my eyes out. So then I have to do something else. And I hate yeah. looking at my phone. Yeah. And so, so there it is. I would rather... I guess I'd rather read this. It's not a great <laughs> book review, is it? I'm not it's like really not. <laughs> I'm not selling that in any way, but that's no, okay. No. And that's then I a... just finished in reading The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Klune. Had I read that earlier, to, we would be talking about that today, Julie. And I'm going down a bit of a TJ Klune rabbit hole. So I also went and consumed in like in a ridiculous amount of time. Under the Whispering Door. Okay, I just got that at the library yesterday. Okay. How, how is it? It's going to make you cry. It's going to make you laugh. He makes me laugh out loud. And yeah. he absolutely tears my heart out. And because I have kids who are, from a mummy point of view, like, oh boy. Mm -hmm. You know, my kids are not easy kids. And I don't say that lightly. We, we have some crazy shit that we deal with and our kids are 11 and 12 and we've gone through four years of extremely intense therapy with them and we work with a group of people. <laughs> we don't even just have a therapist. We have mm -hmm. <laughs> a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a social worker and a family therapist and like we work so intensely. And the biggest thing that I've learned going through that with my kids is learning to accept my kids for who they are. Mm -hmm. And then turning that around and, and supporting them where they're at. And I feel like that part of that storyline just, oh boy, it got me. It mm -hmm. got me good. Oh, and, and I just finished Midnight Library. That I also awesome. read this book that I loved. No, and I love so awesome. many of the books that you're that you interview people on. Oh, good. I got to read I got to read Hidden Valley Road and Taste Like War back to back. And I have to say, going through again, going going through the mom thing mm -hmm. and having kids who have a misunderstood medical situation that is mental health related. Yeah. Wow. So powerful. Again, it's that thing that we were talking about at the beginning of just that sometimes you just need someone to say, yes, I've been there. And yeah. it doesn't solve anything. It gives you something extra mm -hmm. knowing that you're not alone and as bleak as those two books were, because they were both so sad. And understanding how, like, I can't believe nothing's changed was the way it felt, I guess, which is kind of sad. But it also made me realize, like, to help me change my expectations and my perspective of what I'm going through. Like, don't expect anything to change. So get better at doing what you're doing right now. Mm. It, it, it was good for telling me that. Okay, Erin, this okay. has been amazing. <laughs> I could do this all day. <sighs> Why don't you share with our listeners where they can find you and the work that you do online? Sure. I co-host the Three Kitchens podcast with my good friend, Heather Dyer, and we also have a third friend, Sarah, who joins us to do a weekly episode where we drink fancy <laughs> drinks, fun drinks. We maybe have a little bit too much fun doing those episodes, but we share our love of home cooking and we get to meet and interact and interview a whole bunch of really interesting people in the home cooking and food 
worlds. We release an episode on Tuesdays where we either have an interview or we go through a recipe of something that we have been challenged to cook or we don't know how to cook or Mm. something that we love to cook. And we kind of want to create a community where others get into their kitchen and just have fun with it. That is my favorite thing of your podcast is, again, how adventurous you are and that <laughs> you're willing to try things. And and even when there are things that you haven't come across before, you, you know, it's not just like, I want to copy the scones at my favorite bakery, which there's mm. nothing wrong with scones. Don't get me wrong. But I love how you guys go. I read about this thing that Mm. I want to try. And it's so neat that you just try it without any, like, what's the worst that could happen? It doesn't taste good. So what? (laughs) You order pizza, you know, and it makes, it makes everything so much fun to listen to. It's a really, and it doesn't surprise me at all that you then also like adventurous books (laughs) 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 and adventurous camping. So I want to thank you for joining me today. And I, I hope you will come back anytime and every time you have a book to tell me about. You have amazing taste in books and it's so fun talking to you. And I hope you'll just come back anytime. You bet. I also want to invite you (gasps) to come and drink with us one night. Oh, anytime. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Well, so in this book, Endurance, at one point, they do mention this cocktail that one of the men says is his favorite cocktail to make. Well, they're sitting in their tents, soaking wet. And this cocktail was called the Bosom Caresser, which is so wildly inappropriate and absolutely hilarious. Yeah. Will you come and do an episode? Are you kidding me? With us? A hundred percent. You in the room? You betcha. Uh, I can't wait to say to my husband, I'm going to go have a bosom caresser. With my girlfriends, my Canadian girlfriends. (laughs) Oh, good. What's in it? Do you you have that jotted down? If it's like seal blood or something, I'm not drinking that. No, no. This is one of his, it's his recipe or it's his cocktail from home that he made. It has, I don't think it has anything to do with being out of that. (laughs) First, Julie, we have to go on an adventure. (laughs) Obviously. (laughs) Okay. It's got... Cognac, Grand Marnier, Madeira wine, grenadine syrup, and an egg yolk. You shake everything and strain into a chilled glass. Sounds really sweet, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The Grand Marnier and the and the grenadine. I I okay. Well, I can't wait. And yes, I'm in. I'm always in for cocktail hour. Oh yes. I will be there. So thank you for that. And thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Bookworms, even though I'm not a particularly adventurous person, I really did enjoy this story. And I'm eager to hear if you've read it and what you thought and if you'd recommend any other of these outdoorsy books that read like a novel. Let me know over on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. Links to everything Erin and I discussed are available in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave a review wherever you're listening. If you want to learn more about my weekly guests, as well as get a little peek into what I'm reading and listening to in my free time, subscribe to my weekly pod newsletter at bestbookeverpodcast.substack.com. The newsletter's free, but once you get there, you'll see a few different paid options if you want to help me keep the candles burning over here in my reading cave. Thank you for joining me today, and as always, I will see you at the library. Did you ever have one of those days where you go, maybe I'm not a bad mom, maybe they're just rotten kids? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Are you sure that that one belongs to me? What? Maybe they got switched. Maybe someone gave me. Maybe I should go back and double check.